Welcome to Taking Care of Lady Business, where we put the business back in lady business. Hosted by Jennifer Justice, founder and CEO of the Justice Department, a management strategy and law firm that works with female and woke male entrepreneurs, executives, talent, brands, and creatives to build and maximize their wealth, focusing in the areas of tech, consumer product, finance, media, entertainment, and fashion. Jennifer interviews entrepreneurial women who have done it all, who will be sharing their secrets on all things business, especially as a woman. These highly successful women will share strategies and insights, including what not to do and what it takes to win. And now, here's your host, Jennifer Justice. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode of Taking Care of Lady Business. We're putting some business back into our lady business. Today, we have uh, an amazing guest, Monique Maley. She is the CEO and president of a company called Articulate Persuasion. So I think even by the sound of that company, we're going to really understand how we own our power as women and persuade people. Um, But I will let her do the explaining of everything that she does. Welcome, Monique. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, I mean, we're excited to hear everything you have to tell us. Why don't we start by saying what your company is doing right now and what it does, why you started it? So, oh gosh, that's a that's a lot of questions in one. And um, I'll tell you what I'm doing right now, and I'll kind of then go into how it started. So, what I do is I do coaching, consulting, um, in officially leadership development. But what I really do, the reason why people pay me is I help leaders become influential and persuasive. And, you know, I always say that my clients really don't care how I do that, whether I coach them or whether I blow magic fairy dust all over them. And they're always paying for the outcome, which is how do we level up as leaders to stay on pace and even better stay two steps ahead of the growth of our own companies? Because we have to grow as leaders today's world, now businesses grow so fast that we don't have the time to grow as leaders the way we might have done 50 years ago. So how do we accelerate our own leadership growth to stay two steps ahead of of where our companies are? So not only where your companies are in a growth stage, but also where we are as a culture, right? Completely. Yeah. And that growth is affected by everything. Growth is affected by the market. The growth is affected by who's on your team. Uh, what's happening in your industry, you know, new competitor pops up, everything changes. There's a, you know, a slide, there's a pandemic, right? All of those things that often are discussed in terms of resilience and adaptability and all of those things, those are all skill sets that we have to build as leaders, because at some point, all of us, no matter who we are, what we do, what level we are within in an organization, um, we're going to face all of those challenges at some point. Right. So the second part, so I started the business 12 years ago, largely because I have been an entrepreneur um, most of my professional life or a good chunk of my professional life. And what I realize is that it is such a lonely place to be leading an organization or a team. And having a coach for a business is not unlike um, the best athletes having a coach to get to the Olympics, right? It's a place where you're not alone, somebody who brings perspective, who can give you some tools and strategies and exercises. But mostly, I think it's just having that partner so that you're not thinking through everything on your own. And so these people, when they come to you, I mean, are they there for like, like the long haul? You have them for their career? How does that work? Well, the way I like to work is that I like to work with clients for six months first. Mm -hmm. Let's get started. And then I often work with them. I've got clients I've worked with for, I've got a couple of clients I've been working with for about two years, but I always take a break in between because it's a terrible business model. So I'm perfectly aware of that, but it's the only thing that I feel I have integrity around, which is that my goal is to eventually put myself out of business with my clients, give them the tools, not only to make the shifts that they need in the moment, but to start being able to self-assess, create, you know, leadership development goals, create plans, because what I want them to do is not only do that for themselves, but start doing that for their teams, right? If a leader is a coach, then that's what we want leaders to be doing for their teams as well. So ideally people should be able to make a shift and then move on. 
oftentimes they come back to me even three years later when there is an inflection point, they're in a new organization, they've got a new role, they completely want to take a jump off a cliff and they need to figure out what to do next. Getting clarity around what their next step is is, is a really easy um, time for them to circle back. And do they come to you knowing what they need to know or they're just like, I need a coach? I think very much they they come to me because they they know something needs to be different. Sometimes they know what that is. Uh, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they know what it is, but don't know how to get there. And sometimes they need somebody to hold them accountable. Because oftentimes, if you, if you think about sort of very entrepreneurial leaders, which is really my favorite space, people who, and I say entrepreneurial leaders, not just founders, entrepreneurs in that sense, but I think of these as folks who are highly adaptable. They're always looking for ways to improve they are really open to change. It's not something that necessarily they're stuck in a mold. So I find that those sorts of folks are more open to iterating on, their, on themselves more regularly, but they're also often great at ideation and not always good at execution. So having somebody who can help them with the execution side of this development is, I think, really right. helpful. You give them like real tactical bits of things to do to... Yeah. Yeah. I call it work, work. I don't believe in giving people homework because if anybody else's work is like mine, I got enough to do in my day that I don't want to be staying up late doing homework. Uh, So what I try and do is give people tools and exercises to be incorporating into their day because that's what we want to do. The way to shift behaviors or shift routines is not to sort of set it aside in something we do on a Saturday. It's something that, okay, this day, I'm going to just tweak this one thing and see what happens. And what I love about the work that I do is that that's sometimes it's just, you show up slightly differently one day. If you shift your energy, if you shift the way you engage with someone, if you focus in on being a bit more clear, a bit more precise on something, there's an immediate return on that investment of, of how people engage with you, how people react to you, how, smoothly a process goes, all those sorts of things start to, to domino. And then that reinforces you making another small shift. And along the way, so you're helping them like in this whole chain of events to get to sure. like another level. I read somewhere that you had said to like, not um, um, something about leaders being coached, not trained. Yeah. So what does that I think mean? That, I mean, I thought about that. I was like, oh my God, I never, because I've had an executive coach and right. she was super instrumental in me starting my own business. You know, she'd seen me leave one company and then go to another one and, you know, thinking about going to another one. And she's like, why do you keep doing this? You know? Um, and it was super instrumental. I never really thought about like the difference between training and coaching. Right. You know? So the way I think of it is that um, you train for hard skills and you coach for soft skills. Uh, You can have a process to learn how to do something tactical or tangible. Uh, I think coaching has to be, you have to be in the moment. I call it present coaching. I have to meet you where you are. Every every time we have a meeting, um, if you've just had a bad board meeting, then that's gonna be top of mind for you. And so we need to work where you are in that moment. Mm -hmm. I can't have a set agenda that the third time we meet, we discuss, blank. Um, That just, it does, that kind of structure doesn't work in coaching. Um, And what I love to do is then take those moments, take those conversations, take those meetings, take those incidents and start putting them through the lens of, okay, these are the goals. These are the things we're looking to work on. How do we approach this differently? How could you rewrite the script on that meeting? Or ideally having a conversation even before something big happens. It's very common with clients that I have a meeting prior to a board meeting. How can you show up to that board meeting to be the most effective Mm -hmm. leader for your organization that you can? And that is articulating your message clearly, thinking about how you're gonna get the buy-in and persuasion that you need from your board. It's about owning the room, right? The confidence that we have to have um, in order to show up as a peer. Um, and a partner within that group in order to execute on these ideas. So all of that, I love to especially help people beforehand, but sometimes it's after the fact. 
Right. Yeah. No, I've had that too, where I had to go in and have this really tough conversation. And I talked to my coach prior and she actually brought up all these points of arguments that I could actually have, you know, for, you know, to put up my case. And I was like, oh my God, I never even thought about that, you know? And it was, I used all of them and it was so helpful and totally turned how the entire conversation could have been. Completely clarifying the message, not just what you want to say, but really what you want to achieve, right? What is the outcome of this meeting? What do I want to get them to say yes to? What action do I want them to take? Mm -hmm. The more you clarify that, that's really powerful. But also on the other side, I had a client who there was this intimidation factor, had these sort of jerky, let's just be honest, VCs on the board who there was an element of condescension to a very scientific founder. And there was always the, the founder and CEO always had this sense that they had, he had to go and ask them for permission. And I said, here's the thing. Ultimately, that dynamic is not going to serve you or the organization. Because if you guys are not working as peers, as, as part of a team and partners to make the best decisions for mm-hmm. the organization, it's, it's not going to work effectively. So you go in with a solution not to ask for permission, but to say, to just lay out your arguments. This is why this is the plan I want to take. Now they may come back with great reasons why that's not the right thing to do. But if you walk in thinking, Hey guys, what do you think? Then that shifts the dynamic in that meeting. And that really undermines you as the leader of your organization. Right. Yeah. Um, And this podcast basically is for women, right? Yeah. So you are coaching. Yes. And predominantly so, women, because I actually find that they are more coachable. Wow. They are more open. The thing I would say is if you want things to be different, you have to do things differently. And a lot of people want things to be different, but they want to do everything the same. And I have had over the years, um, I, I can see them coming pretty early on in the discovery process now, fortunately, but early on, especially There are a few clients who I had to say, look, this isn't working. And every time I've had to do that, it was a male client. Now, I'm not saying that's all men. I've had some great male clients who are really open and very coachable. But I do find women who come to me are like sponges and are really willing to roll up their sleeves and try something differently in order to get to where they want to go. Right. So that, I mean, you did bring up a good point. Like when should somebody come to you? How early? What do you mean by the discovery process? So the discovery process is just that initial conversation that I have with people once they've already reached out to me. But I, when people come, I think, I personally think this sort of thing is preventative medicine. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, you know, you probably know this better than anybody is that most people hire attorneys about three months after they should have hired an attorney uh, when they're already in the thick of it, when they already have a bad relationship with their board of directors or when they have a dysfunctional team or when things are, are becoming challenging for them as leaders, you really want to set yourself up to be again, two steps ahead of wherever your business is. So I think it's, it's a great investment in every client that I've seen who comes in early. The minute you start, getting into a place, whether it's me or anybody else, right? When you're in a place where you are the leader of an organization, there are conversations you cannot have with your team. There are conversations you may not want to have the full thought process with your board or with your own boss. Having a coach in those moments is what gets you through hard times. It helps you think through processes. It helps you hire better. It helps you lead your team better. And that just seems like the common sense, eating healthy, going to the gym kind of preventative medicine that we do for our body. But what if we did that for our leadership? And the knock on effect that that then has for our organizations is huge. Um, As I mentioned, though, it's often inflection points. They've just been promoted or they're going after a promotion or they've just moved to another new organization. Or unfortunately, sometimes the inflection point is that just the board meeting went really, really poorly and they got some negative feedback or, or their boss told them they have to find a coach or something. Like right. That. I mean, some companies actually provide, you know, these services, which is amazing. And I think amazing. All of and them that's do. happening more and more, which I think is yeah. tremendous. Yeah. 
Um, and so when you see women, like what, like, I, obviously you have client confidentiality, but I'm saying like, Absolutely. what are common themes that you you see that we have like negative and positive that right. you know because I think one of the things is we always put blame on ourselves right right we're always like we're not worthy we have imposter syndrome we you know we don't know enough about business we have to be 130 percent prepared all the stats that we talk about all on, on this all the time and that we hear and anybody who knows you know anything about the gender pay gap etc knows the things that you know we seem to not be the best at not like we need another thing to be told that we're not great at but you know these are ways to improve um right. very easily and well and anybody great. who thinks i don't care how long you've been a leader needs to, anybody who thinks that they don't need to to level up is it's like they're moving back because yeah. as the world changes you've got to evolve with that but i think that there are certainly some common themes with the female founders and leaders that i work with the first one really is what i call the internal narrative it's your mindset and I think this is where we as women get in our way more than anything else. And a lot of these internal narratives were plopped into our head pretty early on, uh, sometimes by family members, sometimes by, you know, bosses or people we worked with early on in our careers, sometimes just media, bad narratives that I think that this idea of imposter syndrome, which is such a, a triggering term for everybody, I personally hate it because I don't think that. I don't know that we really feel like imposters. I just think if you've never seen somebody be who you are out in the world, then how do you know if you're anywhere close to getting it right? And so I think that for, for a lot of us, it's really lack of role models, lack of conversations, lack of being in the room, lack of the vernacular, just the terminology when you're, especially if you're founding a company, there are so many things you want to learn just to feel comfortable having a conversation, even with a very early stage investor, mm -hmm. they start asking you about churn or traction or cogs or all those terms that come up and you don't feel hundred percent confident, even about what the terms are much less what the answers to those sorts yeah. of questions are. Our internal narrative becomes, I don't belong here. I don't know what I'm doing. I am not. And this mindset is, I think, those narratives are the most limiting because they're, especially because they're the ones that we put on ourselves. Like we got enough out in the world. There's enough glass ceilings out there, right? There are enough doors that are closed to us. There are enough hurdles we have to get over that creating any for ourselves is really frustrating by the same token. The great news is that because we're the ones that put them up, we're the ones who can tear them down. Yeah. So shifting the internal narrative into something that is more constructive, um, a very common internal narrative, for example, with founders, people who are really in the startup world is that they will, when they think of the vision of their company, they think about what they can execute on, right? And this is, and they ask for the money that they think they can get, not the money that they want or need. And not something beyond, maybe I don't know how to, maybe I don't know today how to execute on this, but this is what I want this business to be. And so from an investor point of view, it's great because you invest in a female company, she's going to be very judicious with your money. But sometimes female founders starve their own businesses because they don't go big enough. Right. And that again is an internal layer of, I don't want to take on more than I feel I can uh, commit to or that I can deliver. So that you've seen the research about how um, a man applies for a job that he only feels 60% qualified for, where a woman will feel like she has to be 100% qualified. Mm -hmm. Well, if we are never stretching ourselves, if we're never getting into this unknown area, then regardless of whether we are leading a team for a large multinational corporation or we are founding our own company, we are limiting what we can do if we're only going to do things that we already know how to do mm -hmm. and feeling that internal narrative that says, I don't know how to do it yet. And so with my clients, I often say, sometimes it's about tweaking wording in our internal narrative. So instead of asking yourself, if you're qualified, ask yourself if you're ready, mm -hmm. don't ask yourself if you already know, ask yourself if you're smart enough to figure it out right? or to get the, people together who can figure it out. That can be so powerful.
So one of the other things, one of the other stats is that women are hired on experience and men on potential, right? So there are some leaders who have that unfortunate quality. When I was, when I left one company and I was looking for another position, people would say to me, "Um, but you've never been president before. And I was like, neither was Obama. Like, who cares? Like, Yeah, well, that's, and that's external, right? But then by the same token, the research also shows that women focus on competence yeah. Versus confidence, which is logical, right? It's, of course, we want to be great at what we do. The problem with that is that that often goes unseen. Mm-hmm. So how many things do you do in the day that you don't go out and toot your horn about that people don't know how awesome you are, where a man is great at that? So the example I always use with this, um, if you've ever lived with a man, you know, he will tell you every time he takes out the trash. Every time he puts down the toilet seat or changes the roll of toilet paper or whatever that may be. But a woman does not go around the house saying, I emptied the dishwasher, I fed the dogs, I bathed the kid, I made the bed, I whatever. Mm. But men do that same thing at work. I closed the deal, I got the meeting, I'm off to see so and so. Whereas women, we just get down and we get to work because why would we be telling everybody what we do? It's like, of course, that's my job. Yeah. Why would I need to tell people? But that lack of visibility is that that dividing line between the focus on competence and confidence. People see what you're doing. Right. Uh, but only if there is some visibility around it. Mm-hmm. So how do you get over that? Did you go around bragging and saying what you do? I mean, because well, yeah. of- you know. And that's the challenge, right? Women are not particularly like we're not horn tutors for the most part. Some women are great at it. And I am so, I love those kinds of people. I was never that my first professional work was as an actor. Um, I worked professionally in theater and film for many years. And I loved having an agent because my agent co out and toot my yeah, horn for me. Exactly. Yeah. And so we, as women were kind of, you know, bragging and all that sort of stuff is it is a, bad quality in women. That's again, that internal narrative. But I try and say, you don't brag because we don't feel comfortable with it, but can you just articulate wins? Small wins, micro wins, just verbalize them. Um, We're great at giving our team credit, but why is it always you guys and never we? Um, If your team is working really well, then you're probably part of the reason why. Mm -hmm. So we have to see those things that we've done and we've accomplished as wins and then just mention them, just share them or have people who are our peers or who can also support us in that, that pinging that, that information around because we have to be visible in that sense mm-hmm. and um, not just physically visible, especially now in a virtual world, but our bosses are, all these folks have to see our competence because that's where the confidence them having confidence in us comes from. So you think it's doing things like having a friend, like a colleague, like mention it in a meeting and things because you, you know, if you don't feel comfortable doing it yourself. Right. So I always love the example of um, that. Barely, I understand that uh, Valerie Jared started this in the Obama white house, which is, you know how it is. You can be in a meeting and if there are women in there, they, someone might come up with an idea. And then five minutes later, The guy says it and it's if somebody was studying it for the first time. So she started doing is that they would echo if another woman shared something that another woman at the table would be echoing that. I love what, you know, Jennifer said when she said, or I think Jennifer's right when she says, blah, blah, blah. Yes. Do we need to support each other? Absolutely. Can men do that same thing? Absolutely. Yeah, they, 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 I mean, absolutely. There is no reason. And that's why. You know, you see some of the most successful women, successful, I hate to use that term because that's another challenge in our internal narratives. We are finding success the way men have defined success Mm -hmm. for many, many, many years. And in my experience, women define success in a different way and getting comfortable with that definition is a real thing uh, for us to look at. But if you look at just some of the women who have reached really high levels at big organizations, a lot of them will tell you that they had a sponsor. Yeah. And a sponsor, somebody walks in the room and toots your horn for you. 
Yeah. Yeah. I'm friends with Alyssa Master Monaco, who is, who is the chief of staff. And she told me all of this stuff too. And it was, yeah, and it's true. And they would, and, you know, and I have done it many times when I was in, you know, different meetings. It was like, yeah, that was, uh, I thought it was a great idea when she said it the first time. Thanks for yeah. articulating it again. <laughs> but, you know, exactly. I also joined companies where I was like, they knew who I was. It was like four men and they were like, okay, you know, she's going to come at us. We deserve it. We're ready to listen. And they were, and they were great. And I would point out things like you guys keep using like, Hey, you got to skate to the puck. I was like, I don't know what that means. Like, I don't know. I mean, I can figure it out. I, I did, right. but I wasn't, I was like, not everybody knows hockey. Like you can't use all these references all the time. And back to the point you'd made a while ago, the vernacular, like I tell the story all the time about somebody on the phone, like talking about, um, Oh, it's the term that they use for extra money. Now I can't even remember it. So it's a bad story. But anyway, I was like, what are they talking about? What are they talking about? And I looked at Googled it and I was like, oh my God. Yeah. And there's a lot of that. And honestly, I mean, I stay on top of it because I do a lot of mentoring with startups, but there's a new term every five minutes yeah. and it's a lot to stay on top of, but that's the easy stuff, right? That's the easy stuff, getting our own internal narrative. But I also wanted to share, you know, some of the trends that I see of what I think women do really, really well. Yeah. And again, this is generalizations. Please don't anybody send messages to the podcast saying, oh, that's not true, because everything is trends, which means they're going to be outliers, both for men and for women. But for the most part, um, women are great at networking and collaborating. They tend to be good at facilitating collaboration within a group. They're not always great about taking credit for what they did within that collaboration, mm -hmm. but that's another story for another day. They're really great at building networks. Um, the downside is they're not always as good about leveraging those networks. We have to get more comfortable with, a colleague of mine said this example once, and I thought it's so true, that a man will reach out to somebody in their network that they may not have talked to in six years and say, hey... I'm applying for this job at your company. I know we haven't chatted for a while, but if you can put it in a good word for me yeah. or whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, and a woman would, and if a woman did that, she'd be like, I can't believe I haven't talked to her in six years and she's asking me to do this. And just, we have this weird dynamic with our, our networks, but we're so much better at building them and connecting people yeah. in my and experience. So we just yeah. need to leverage that more yeah. because yeah. that connection part is huge. Um, dry powder. That's the term. It was like, they kept talking about dry powder, dry powder. And I was like, yeah, what's that? Like, and then I looked uh, at yeah. oh, extra money. Like, come on. It's the same yeah. amount of syllables. Like who, even, I don't even know what it means. Oh, I don't even know where it came up. Anyways, all jargon. that dumb stuff, you know, but like, I actually want to go back a little bit to what you were saying about success and your own, like yeah. what, how we define success. And this just happened to me yesterday where I got in this funk because you know, there was somebody, a man that, you know, was much junior to me and like had all that got all the success and I was comparing myself and, um, and I'm sitting here going, but wait a minute, I'm a single mom to twins. I've done this all myself where, you know, he's married, stay at home mom, you know what I mean? And had like, you know, with kids and like, like the amount that I get done in a week, like the, he couldn't do in six months, yeah. you know, yeah, he probably so, has a work wife as well as a home wife. And, exactly. Exactly. And I so, think that's yeah. such a challenge. And yeah. I, you know, it's very something when I was starting this business. So I've had businesses before I've been very successful in the traditional sense, many employees, many dollars, lots of zeros. And I created a business that I loathed my job. Like I created a job for myself that I hated. So that was not my definition of success. At that point, I said, okay, what does define success for me? And I realized I had to get out of the mindset of what I had grown up with, that you have to move up a particular ladder, that the ultimate pinnacle is the CEO of a Fortune 500 company or a Fortune 100 company. There is nothing on the earth that would ever, I would ever want to do that job. I want to, what really makes me feel satisfied and fulfilled has nothing to do with what is entailed in being good at that job. Could I do it? It's not about capability. And I think that that's where we kind of get in our own way is that we think that if we don't do it, that someone's going to think we're not capable of doing it. And they may, right? We can't stop that. But that's no reason to turn yourself into a pretzel every day to prove to somebody who doesn't matter to your life 
that you're capable of something. Mm -hmm. And it's more important to say, I want to wake up every day and achieve all the things in my work life that are important to me. Whatever that means financially may be different for some people than other. If a title is important to you, then I think go for that. It's not important to me. That does not fulfill me. That does not make me feel more valuable or valued, right? But it's okay if that does mean for something for someone. And so defining it for yourself and being okay with the fact that as long as you're hitting your definition, that that is the goal rather than somebody else's random goal that sometimes even the guys doesn't satisfy them. It's yeah. not what they no, want. Of course, it doesn't fulfill of them. It's a lot of smoke and mirrors, you know, yeah, and, it, and it's lot. hard and it's hard, you know, like the saying goes, it's lonely at the top. And when you're a founder and when you're, yeah. you know, all the way up to fortune 500. So, I mean, you wrote a book dealing with a lot of these issues, correct? Mm-hmm. Yes, I did. Called turbulence. Called turbulence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the title comes from, you know, it's sort of semi unfortunate came out when it did in that people assume that it has to do with the sort of the turbulence of the pandemic, which it, it doesn't at all. It's a term I've been using with clients for years. And it's this sort of unseen sort of uh, disjointed, jarring sort of bumpiness that can happen within organizations because leaders Um, have challenges, things that they need to work on, things that that they need to smooth off or the things that are happening within their teams. And so really looking at where these areas of turbulence tend to happen. So it's everything from helping people really think about and get much better at, at really effective conversations. That seems so basic. But if I can have more effective conversations with folks, whether it be a team member that I'm really looking to coach and level up and work them through a hard time or of my board, somebody on my board that maybe is a bit of a prickly pear or any of those things. It's uh, storytelling, which is such an important component of leadership mm-hmm. and more and more being recognized as such. Um, and then the whole confidence uh, component, which I think has two sides. I think there's an internal, which is this internal narrative or mindset. And then the external, which is our executive presence. So for us as females, there is an added component in our executive presence. How do we show up as smart leaders, great thinkers of our business, industry leaders, whatever that is, as opposed to the woman in the room or the blonde or the petite or the young or the over 40, you know, the things that when people see us, they put us in a box. How can we show up as a leader? Yeah, as that's interesting. As we saw, you know, a lot of female founders in particular, you know, the quote unquote traditional, like successful ones, meaning they've raised a ton of money, et cetera. We're all getting taken down, you know, mm-hmm. and, you know, for behavior that I saw my entire career and didn't even compare to what, right. like, and that was just normal, by the way, for men, just like sure. completely normal and commonplace and you didn't even bat an eye and they were getting taken down for like the most ridiculous small things for the yeah. most part in the grand scheme of things. And I'm not saying anybody who suffered anything, I'm not trying to take away that, but what I'm saying is like being put up, you know, by in the workplace by men constantly, like, how do you manage that external? Because it just kept putting us back as women and, you know, well- and see. I think that's a really interesting question. And for me, at least in the work that I do, especially with mentoring and working with um, earlier stage, sort of up to series B founders, is that I think that there's preventative medicine in that. I think that um, being able to lead your own business long term for men or women has to do with having really smart conversations with investors early on and not just thinking of them as, oh, they want to invest. I want them on my cap table. Like, no. If you're going to be on your cap table, you're married, you're getting under the covers together. You want to make sure that you're getting into bed with people that respect you, that understand you, that have your vision. And so I think that oftentimes there's that if the people who will come into your board are not people who respect you as a leader, um, they will look for excuses like that Mm -hmm. to move you aside. By the same token, and I think this is one of the harder things often for founders that I see, and this is everybody, 
is that there may be things, again, we go back to this defining success. It's also about what we're great at. Being an entrepreneur and being a founder is a very different job than being a CEO. And for me, I learned that in that I hate being the CEO because there's a lot of being a therapist in that that I didn't want to do. There's a lot of bureaucracy in that. I love the engagement, the one-on-one with my team, with my clients. And uh, I love building. I love ideating. I love getting a team together that can execute on ideas. And sometimes the ideal founder or entrepreneur for an organization, there may be an inflection point in the business where it's better to step into a CTO role or a um, chief creative officer or chief evangelist, and you just have a seat on the board and somebody else comes in as CEO. But it's about having that healthy conversation with yourself to say, what's right? Where do I shine? Where's my value? Mm -hmm. And then articulating that to yourself and to other people. Right. I mean, the external, we're going to be held to double standards for quite a while, right? Yeah. Um, We can't get away with that around that yet, but we can try and mitigate it as much as possible. Right. And have people on our board who will stand up for us and be like, you you know, yeah. Well, the more confidence and conviction we have in ourselves, the more we're going to be able to elicit that from other people. Sorry to have interrupted. Yeah. No, 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 no. It's great. Thank you so much. I could like talk about this all day long. And I think it's so, I mean, it's so important for women in the workplace to hear these kinds of things, you know, knowing that like, it's not like there are things that, you know, we are telling ourselves that we don't need to tell ourselves and let's, you know, try to control our internal narrative. And so thank you so much for talking all about that. Um, As you know, there's one question that I ask at the very end, and that is what is the worst advice that you've ever received? Yeah, this was, I, as I mentioned to you, this is a real struggle for me because I've received a lot of really, really bad yeah. advice uh, in my life and um, at every age, right? I certainly, a lot of it comes to you when you're young and people think that they're all smarter than you and some are, uh, but even later. And I would say two things um, stick out really. One was something I was told when I was actually really young, which was really hard for me because I kind of wove it very neatly into my internal narrative for a long time, which is you always think small. Mm -hmm. And it was said partially, it's not what was said, but it was the tone that was used. So I think that's Mm -hmm. another really important thing we need to think about. And it made me feel small. And I, when I actually look at the evidence of my life and what I've done, there was nothing small. It was all pretty ballsy. So the reality and the narrative did not align, but it certainly stuck with me. I think that's a terrible thing. You can say, I challenge you to think bigger, which is a very different thing than telling somebody they think small. And the other one was just something someone said in anger, which is stay in your box. Yeah. (laughs) Not even in your lane. Yeah. Right. In your box. Your time. This is where you go. <laughs> and I, yeah, that, Whoa. I mean, I don't know how anybody says that to anyone. Um, yeah, but the I ego did not. for both of those people who said that, the ego's behind oh, them. It's like, oh, I'm Well, I mean, for me, the box is a misogynistic. Like, this is the only place that I, I will only deal with your, you're within these parameters. Yeah. To which, of course, I being the, you know, sort of, counterintuitive person, I just go out and start pushing on every side of that box and say, uh, no, yeah. I'll be anywhere but that box that you want me to be in. Bad Good advice. for you. Amazing. Well, thank you so much yep. for all of this. I'm sure people will be looking you up, buying the book, Turbulence. Um, if they do want to look you up, how do they do that? You can find me on my website at articulatepersuasion.com. And you can find me as Monique Maley on LinkedIn. So feel free to reach out. And I am so delighted to have been here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And thank you everyone for listening to this episode of Taking Care of Lady Business. Until next time, I'm Jennifer Justice.